Well, good morning. I'm Brett Vaden. I'm the associate pastor here. In this sermon series, as Stephen mentioned, we are looking at becoming, becoming like Jesus. And throughout this sermon series, we're looking at 12 qualities or markers of Jesus' life. As we look at the life of Jesus, what do we see in him? How does he live the human life in a way that shows us and models for us what our lives are meant for? Last week, Pastor Tim taught us about covenant relationships, about how Jesus leads us in building covenant relationships. And, and today, as we think about relationships and continuing in that, we're looking at as we, as we commit to one another, as we see people in our lives and in this church and we say, I'm going to commit to them, what then does it look like to know and be known? What does it look like for us to have intimacy with one another and true friendship? When I was a kid, I loved building forts. I would take blankets and pillows and sheets, you know, and my buddies would have a sleepover, and I'd build a fort, they'd build a fort, and we'd attack each other, and then after all that died down and we were done uh, attacking each other and being ninjas and all that, we would settle down for the night and just kind of sleep under our our forts and talk about whatever nine-year-olds talk about, and we would eventually fall asleep late in the night. Well, uh, about a week ago, I was saying goodnight to one of my children, uh, and she had made a fort in her bedroom. Um, I mean, and it, her bedroom's not that big to the begin with, so it was basically her whole room was this fort. She had taken chairs. I went to the dining room table. I was like, where's my chair at? It's like, ah, uh, well, <laughs> we, had to, we had to make it for it, Brett, so I had to sacrifice. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, I was in there with her saying goodnight. You know, I had to kind of get down on my knees and lift up a blanket so I could peek in and poke my head through. And, and she's like, Dad, you came in the wrong way. It's the other way. That's where the door, oh, right, right, sorry. Uh, so I was going to say just a quick goodnight to her and pray with her. And I did that. I was praying, and I was... I was about to crawl out to leave, and she, she pleaded. She said, hey, Dad, why don't, you, why don't you actually come all the way in, and let's just, let's just be here for a little bit. Let's, I gotta, let's just talk. And so I said, oh, okay. And I'm really glad I did. Uh, as I crawled in there and lay down beside her, we just started talking, and she started asking me questions. Uh, in my prayer with her just before, I had mentioned heaven. You know, and that got her going. She had all kinds of questions about heaven. Uh, she was asking me things like, uh, what will heaven be like? You know, when Jesus comes and brings his kingdom one day, when he brings heaven here, what's that going to be like? And we talked about how Jesus would make everything we loved most about the world even better. We talked about the woods and the mountains and the rivers. We talked about the animals, the people, even the cities, how God was going to restore and renew all things. We talked about some pets that we had, that we had lost would we see them again? So we talked about some of these things we love most in our life together and how Jesus would make all things new in heaven on earth one day. And it was just delightful, just laying there under these sheets and next to pillows and talking with my daughter. And my heart was just filled to the brim. I was so happy that I was in that moment with her. And after a few minutes in, I, I didn't want to leave anymore. I just wanted to be there with her. And it took effort to eventually crawl out of the fort and go to, to bed because, you know, school comes in the morning. And it hit me how much I love that little girl and how thankful I am to know her and be known by her. What a gift it is to have that kind of conversation with someone. I'd give a lot to have more times like that with her. And uh, connecting not just as dad and daughter, but, but as, as, even as friends. And that's something I can always look forward to with my kids, is that friendship as we grow together. Our hearts long for friendship. We desire intimacy to know and be known by others. But there's a lot in the way of that. A lot blocking us from intimacy. It's hard to know and be known. So easy to be misunderstood, so easy to be misrepresented, to say the wrong thing, to choose the wrong people to be friends with, 
And it's just easier to avoid the effort. It's, it's, it's easier not to even try. And, and maybe to find intimacy in other ways. Watch, watch TV shows where those people on the show work through their relational problems. Maybe have a vicarious sense of intimacy through those people, those friends, as they try to work out problems in their life together. But that doesn't work. I can't be friends with people in a TV show, right? And watching them work through their problems doesn't solve my real problems here in the real world. So I try not to think about it. I put more into my work, into my hobbies, try not to think about how lonely and how much I desire intimacy and friendship. And maybe I just stop watching shows about drama and friendship altogether. Maybe I'm just going to watch some more sports. Hey, March Madness is coming up. Yeah, I'll watch some games. And you know, come to think of it, I should invite so-and-so over to watch a game with me, you know? It'd be nice to have somebody with me as I watch the show. You see, we can't get away from our need from a relationship. We can't get away from our need just to have someone there with us. It's built in. We're made for intimacy. Intimacy with others, definitely. But even more, to know and be known by our Creator, by the one who shaped us and formed us in the womb, by the one who's always seen us and known us and desires us to know Him, God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the whole reason that Jesus came. Jesus wants to bring us into intimacy with God. Jesus came to bring us into a relationship where we would know and be known by God. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The problem is we don't recognize Jesus Just like the woman at the well. Go back to John 4 with me. Look in your Bibles right there. In verse 6, Jesus is sitting by the well. And he's been walking many hours. He's been traveling. He's going back to his home base in Galilee. And he's having to travel through Samaria. He's tired and thirsty after walking all morning, several hours. But he's got no bucket. He's there by the well. And a woman comes to get water with her jar. He asks her for a drink. She doesn't know who he is other than a thirsty man. She doesn't realize this is God in the flesh that's talking to her. She has no clue that the Son of God has just spoken words to her. All she sees is a man with chapped lips and sweat on his brow. She does not recognize Jesus. And this woman is us. This woman is us. God wants him to to reveal himself to us, but we miss him. Because maybe we're expecting God to look different. I'm looking for God to to show up in a God-sized way, an audible voice from heaven, a burning bush writing to appear on the wall before me. And hasn't God shown up like that before? Isn't isn't that what the Bible tells us? I would expect God to do a God-sized thing to get my attention, something so remarkable that it would just grab my heart. And God has done that before. He has used those kinds of spectacular means before. It's true. But even for the people who experienced the burning bush and the thunder from the sky, that was not the norm for them. That was not the regular day in and day out life with God they knew. God will sometimes use a megaphone, but he more often prefers to use a whisper. God may tear through the clouds speaking thunder, but it's more likely that he just wants to sit down next to you and have a conversation, ask you a question. If I want intimacy with a friend, I don't yell. You know, Rachel, my wife, and I will often have conversations in the house where we holler at each other. Not yelling, we we holler, okay? I'm from Tennessee, that's what what we do, we holler. (laughs) So I'm in the kitchen hurrying to grab some coffee to go, and she's busy drying her hair in the bathroom three rooms away, and and we holler to each other, right? Hey, babe, you about ready? What? I said, you about ready? Yeah. All right, I got coffee for us. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. And and hey, why don't you make some coffee to go for me? (laughs) Yeah, all right. Hollering is often necessary as we hurry out the door. But I'm glad that's not the only way we talk to each other. Hollering and hurrying isn't intimate. Intimacy needs more stillness, more quietness, 
not hollering, but talking side by side and face to face. I love getting coffee with a friend or someone I'm getting to know. I love going to Starbucks and just pulling, like getting the smallest table so that like it's just me and my friend and we can look across from each other and, and just talk, sip on our drinks. I usually schedule an hour or so with not much of an agenda, just listening, just getting to know the person. Love that. I also love the, the high of the coffee, too. Man, Starbucks is, is good. But I just love that, 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 for me, it's kind of thrilling just to get to know someone and, like, connect and realize how much we have in common or, or even how different this person is and how God has shaped them in their life. I love just sitting there with them and asking the Holy Spirit to guide our conversation, maybe to open our minds and hearts to each other. I heard someone say that intimacy means into me you see. It's knowing another person and being known by them. Intimacy requires proximity, right? You've got to get close. You've got to lower your tone from a holler from a distance to a still quiet voice that's right beside you. So we see Jesus in the most mundane and unassuming way, come down, sit on a bench by a well, and ask this woman for a drink of water. She can tell by his clothing and his accent that he's Jewish. She is a Samaritan. Jew and Samaritans, they don't mix. They've got a bad history with each other. Jews thought that contact with Samaritans would make them unclean, that would defile them. So they didn't even, they didn't even share cups and, and plates with each other. They wouldn't eat after each other in each other's presence. So the woman naturally asks, why is this Jewish man talking to me? Doesn't he know where he is? Is he stupid? He's in Samaria. He's talking to me. Why? Jesus, though, is not interested in her tribalism and arguing about the Jew and Samaritan problem. He's there for her. He's there for her thirst. She is thirsty. Oh, she is so thirsty. Like a dry land that's not had rain for years, but she's not thirsty for water. She is thirsty for intimacy, real intimacy with God. You can see that in her story as we look at later in the passage and all the ways that she has tried to find connection and intimacy with people, with men particularly. She doesn't know it, but there's a huge longing inside her for God to come close to her. Psalm 42 says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Will you say that with me? My soul thirsts for God. Say it again. My soul thirsts for God. Do you know that is the real longing of your soul? Will you believe it? If you are a follower of Jesus, will you say that to yourself? Preach that to yourself. Say it. My soul thirsts for God. Our soul thirsts for God. And Jesus came to satisfy that thirst. He came to fill the God-sized thirst by pouring out God on us. He says in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, oh, how he wants to give things to you. If you knew his gift and who it is that is speaking to you, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become a spring of water, welling up into eternal life. What is this living water that Jesus pours out on us? It's not water, it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit on us. The Holy Spirit who came and filled Jesus, who came down upon him. And filled him up, just like a river flows into a reservoir and fills it up to the brim. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and it overflowed. And he pours out the Holy Spirit on people. John the Baptist said in John 1, verse 33, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Why does Jesus want to baptize people in the Holy Spirit? 
to pour it out on them, to pour God on them. Because when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside you, he forever joins you to God. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the Spirit of Jesus and the Father. When he lives in you, it means God lives in you. And with God living in you, you go go from being thirsty for intimacy to be always and forever connected to the intimate love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered why there's so many stories about orphans? So many movies and stories about orphans just longing for a home, trying to find their long-lost parents or, or be accepted into a new family. Oliver Twist, Heidi, Cosette, and Les Miserables, Peter Pan, Mowgli, Harry Potter, Frodo Baggins, Anne of Green Gables, Peter Quill, a.k.a. Star-Lord, and his girlfriend Gamora, too. And since I mentioned two superheroes, let's not forget Clark Kent, Superman, Bruce Wayne, Batman, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, Steve Rogers, Captain America, Natasha Romanova, Black Widow, Matthew Murdock, Daredevil, and many more. It's like somebody right in the comics uh, found a, a storyline and kept on going with it, right? Orphans. Oh, and don't forget Luke Skywalker, too, right? But yeah, but you're going to say, but no, he found his dad. He found his dad, right? Yeah, but it was kind of a twist to that. Remember the scene in Empire Strikes Back, right? Remember Luke? He's like, my father's dead. You killed him. Vader. No, I am your father. Luke, no! So many orphan stories. Why? Because humanity, created in the image of God, created to be God's children, ran away from home. We've run from home. Humanity said to our father, we're done with you. Give us our freedom. Let us take our inheritance and go and live how we want. Be as good as dead to us. That's what we said to God. We ran away. We orphaned ourselves. And we've been living under the bridge in the gutter, eating scraps. And we're so thirsty. We're longing to have a home. We long for the love of the Father and to live in his house. That's the deep desire, the panting of our hearts. We are orphans trying to find our way back home. And Jesus came to bring us there. There's nothing Jesus is more passionate about than bringing us back home. Zeal for God's house consumes him. He wants his house, the house of God, to be a house where we come and we connect to the Father. We know him and are known by him. He is zealous for that. He wants everyone to get back home in God's house. And he says in John 14, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. How does he do this? How does he do this? By pouring the Holy Spirit into us. The Holy Spirit who dwells in followers of Jesus. He stays in us. And what does the Spirit do? What does he do? He whispers in our hearts, you are loved. You are not an orphan. You are a son. You are a daughter. This is the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you're wondering, how does God speak to me? How can I tell the voice of God from other voices in my life? The voice of God always affirms his love for you. The voice of God always affirms that you are accepted and wanted. But we've got to listen. We've got to listen because God prefers not to holler at us. Followers of Jesus, do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know you have God living in you? And are you experiencing connection with him? Are you living, though, as an orphan on the outside of the house, in the front yard, yelling at the Father, hey, I need you. And you don't realize that you're actually already welcome inside. Jesus came to bring us intimacy with God. He pours the Spirit out just for this. The Spirit lives in us like a river, Filling our thirst so we don't have to be thirsty again. Romans 5, 5 says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Jesus wants to bring us into intimacy with God. And then there's another thing that we have to realize, though. For that first thing to happen, intimacy with God, we've got to have intimacy with our own hearts and souls. Jesus brings us also into intimacy with ourselves. What do I mean? 
You know, unfortunately, a lot of this stuff doesn't land on us. All this stuff about living water, the Holy Spirit, intimacy with God, it just flies right over our heads, just like this woman. Just like this woman. She tells Jesus, oh, yeah, living water, that would be great. And I wouldn't have to come to this well all the time. Nice. Nice idea. She's still thinking about water. She's not actually understanding. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And could it be that for you, you live on the surface level, that we, we don't invite God into the depths of our life, and we're just fine with God here and there a little bit in life, but not filling every part of you, filling your gray and muddled thoughts with light, as if God were maybe walking through your mind with you, holding a candle up, showing you what your deepest thoughts are, or maybe like God coming into the caverns of your heart and mining places that you've closed off from him, desires and longings and hurts and wounds, and God wants to go there with you and open up those spaces that you don't look at anymore. Many of us are living a surface-level life because it feels safe. We hide behind masks. We hide behind masks at work and at home. And even to ourselves, we pretend we're someone we're not. But every now and then, the mask slips off, and sometimes it just completely drops, and we lose it, right? We may be okay for a time with the work and the annoyances and the pressure then, but when we get home at the end of the day, ah, we yell at our kids. We yell at our spouse. We, we don't answer the phone when our friend calls us to talk to us. We just had enough, and the mask falls off, and the mask also it's something we wear with God, too. We don't let him in. We don't let him see the true self. Jesus asked the woman, he says, uh, bring me your husband. Oh, I don't have a husband, she says. Never mind that she's had five husbands. That's not important. Never mind that she's with a man now outside of wedlock. Trying to, try, trying to hide the truth from God isn't smart. Right? He's God. He knows. He sees through our masks. He's God, after all. It's not as if our false selves fool God. Yet, they do something much worse than that. Yeah, God can see through our masks. He knows what's really happening in our authentic selves. But he cannot have a relationship when we are living as a false self. If that's how we're presenting to him, yeah, everything's fine, God. Everything's good, right? If we try to have a relationship with God and our false self, we will have none of the intimacy our hearts long for. God cannot have a relationship with a lie. He cannot know someone or something that's not real. He can only have intimacy with us as we truly are. No hiding, no pretending. He wants the real, authentic you. And to get that, he's willing to expose you. Jesus exposes the woman's reality, he cuts through the surface to get to the real woman sitting across from him. And why? Is he trying to shame her by bringing up her past? No, he's trying to save her. Several years ago, I was a, a, a camp counselor of sorts, and I had a group of guys, uh, and these were all high school guys. And throughout the weekend, I would meet with each guy and uh, these are guys 17, 18 years, 18 years old. I'm in my 20s at that point. And uh, I remember having a conversation with one of the guys. We'll call him David. And David starts telling me about some of the struggles in his, in his life and some of the people in his life that are pressuring him into sin and into things that he really knows he shouldn't do. Well, in the moment, I didn't really know how to help David. I was actually a little bit scared because... This was kind of big. I didn't know what to do. But I just told him, I said, well, I know you need to get out of that. You need to, to pull yourself out of that situation with those people. But I let David figure that out for himself. And after that, didn't really have contact with him. Well, fast forward about 10 years. Sitting in my living room one night. Wife is texting a friend. And all of a sudden she says, Brett, did you know? Remember David? Remember David back from that time about 10 years ago? Yeah, I remember David. He's in jail. What? Yeah, he's in jail. 
It was like this bomb dropped on me. And all of a sudden, my mind started racing back to that moment with David. That moment when I had the chance to step into this young man's life. I had the chance to enter in with him and walk with him through what he was going through. But I didn't. The Holy Spirit uncovered my shame in that moment and convicted me of my cowardice. And for the next weeks and months, I had this heavy on me. And then I ended up um, pursuing David, writing him letters in jail. And not long after that, he actually got out of jail. And I remember going to meet him for coffee and talking about what had happened those 10 years ago and how he had asked for my help. Man, it was so hard. He graciously forgave me. And now we, we keep up today. But that moment, oh, man, that moment, what I think back, like, what if I just kept going and the Holy Spirit hadn't dropped the bomb on me? And I just said, you yeah, know, well, that's, that's too bad for him. It would have been eating at me. It would have been eating with me. I, I would have known, oh, man, I did something wrong. I need to find freedom from this. But the Holy Spirit didn't let me do that, thankfully. He, he exposed my sin and my cowardice from those 10 years ago, and he brought me into deeper intimacy with him. It's not fun looking into that stuff, believe me, especially stuff that's happened a long time ago. That's just in the past. I don't want to think about that now. I don't want to go mine that up and dig that up. I got other things I need to do. But the Holy Spirit is not interested in our immediate plans, right? He wants to know us and for us to be fully known by him. And he will expose us if he has to, to get us to wake up. That's because knowledge of God, knowing God, requires knowing ourself. The two are intertwined. The more we know ourselves, the more we can know God. And the more we know God, the more that we can know ourselves, actually. He helps us. He leads us into those places of our heart. The more intimacy we have with our own hearts, the more room for God to be intimate, intimate with us there. 1 Corinthians 2.11 says, Who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person, which is in him? Do you allow your spirit to search yourself? Do you go to those places? Or do you try to cover over painful and shameful parts of your life? If you're not intimate with yourself, how can you expect to have a real relationship with God? 1 Corinthians 2.10 says, The Holy Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Think about that. Our spirit has the ability to search our depths. God's spirit knows the depths of God. What happens when the two come together? We can know the depths of God. The depths of God. We are invited forever into a relationship of son and daughter to him. But it requires that we, we let him go there in our hearts. Psalm 139 says this beautiful prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wrong way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Jesus wants to bring us there. He wants to bring us into intimacy with ourself. And Jesus wants to bring us into intimacy with each other. And that's really what this sermon is all about. It's about that Jesus-shaped quality of knowing and being known by others. We need intimacy with others so much, deep connection. Have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus needed that too? He needed connection. All human beings need connection, and that was true for Jesus. He needed other people that he could trust, he could live with, he could talk to, he could depend on, he could have fun with. Yeah, Jesus had fun. I don't know if you know that. Jesus had fun, right? Jesus and his disciples they, they weren't just his disciples, they were also his friends. He said so in John 15, and he treated them like friends, right? It's just like a close friend to give a person a nickname, nickname isn't it? Right? Your, your close friends give you nicknames, like knucklehead, right, or something like that. <laughs> you know, what does Jesus call Peter, the, the, the stubborn hardhead, but also the dependable one in the group? The rock, right? I mean, Jesus is, I mean, Peter is the original rock, Okay. Before Dwayne Johnson was around. Like, Peter is the rock, 
Jesus called them that. And what about uh, James and John, right? Well, Jesus noticed their, notices their short temper. Hey, what's up, Thunder Sons? Right? What do you got to say? I wonder what nickname he would give you. I wonder what nickname he'd give me. Have you ever asked Jesus that? Maybe we should ask Jesus that. Jesus pursued friendship. He invited people in. Just flip real quick in your Bibles to John 135. Just a couple chapters away, real quick. Two men in John 135. There's this little story. We often miss it. I think it's so great, though. And as his two men are listening to John the Baptist, uh, and John the Baptist uh, catches sight of Jesus walking away. And John says, hey, hey, stop talking. Hey, you see that guy right there? Yeah, we see him. That's the Lamb of God. That's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That guy? Yeah, that guy. So the two guys, they go, and they're, they're following behind Jesus. And they get up close to Jesus. And Jesus realizes that somebody's behind him. And he's like, uh, hi, can I help you? And the, one of them's like, uh, yeah, can we come hang with you? Mind if we talk a little bit? All right, have you ever been uh, maybe in the presence of somebody semi-famous, right? You, you're next to the person. You have a chance to talk to them. You know, you feel like, oh, I really want to say something. I want to get a selfie with that person. But you're kind of also awkward and nervous about it. Um, so, you know, you, you strike up a conversation. You know, two of my friends actually were with me a couple weeks ago when this happened. I saw somebody famous on the street, famous to me, you know, church famous, I guess. And I went and talked to this, this person, this, this sort of celebrity pastor that I admire, and uh, they were all, you know, kind of laughing at me as I did it, as I fumbled over myself, you know, hey, can I get a picture with you? <laughs> and uh, the guy was really cool about it, right? Maybe you've been uh, in the presence of somebody like that, and they just, they're, they're nice, they're cool, they have a conversation with you, but, you know, then it's time to part ways. Not so with Jesus. Jesus says, you want to hang out? You want to know where I'm staying? Sure, that's cool. Come on. And then they ended up spending the whole day with Jesus. And make no mistake, Jesus was the greatest person to ever live, right? Crowds followed him everywhere. He was savvy. He was collected. He was cool. He was magnetic. But he was also incredibly accessible. He describes himself that way. He says, I'm gentle and lowly of heart. Don't be afraid. Come to me. And people saw that. People felt that. They felt seen by Jesus. In the very next story there, after uh, that, that passage in John 2, Nathaniel is brought to Jesus. Uh, Nathaniel's friend, Philip, uh, Philip brings Nathaniel, and, and he's going to introduce him to Jesus. And as Nathaniel is walking up to Jesus, Jesus turns around and sees Nathaniel, and he says, Ah, there is a real Israelite. There's the real deal. And Nathaniel's like, uh, Do I know you? Right? Uh, how, do, how do you know me? I've, I've never met you before in my life. Right? And, and we see Jesus, and he's like, Well, the thing is, I know you, Nathaniel. I know you. Long before Philip brought you here, I knew you. Remember that time under the fig tree? I saw you. Now, we don't know the situation that they're talking about here, and that's the point. This is an inside moment that just Nathaniel and Jesus knows about. And what I suppose is that maybe Nathaniel had a moment under a fig tree one day where he was crying out, God, I just want you to see me. God, I just want you to see me. And Jesus is saying, I saw you. I saw you. I know who you are, Nathaniel. Jesus wants to be known, but he wants to know us. He came to seek us out because he gets us. He knows our situation. He wants to bring us home into the life of God. And when we step into the life and love of intimacy with, with God, we start to become like him. We start to want to have intimacy with others as well and bring them back. Now flip back to John 4, back to the Samaritan woman. John 4, verse 28. Back in the village, she told the people, come, see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this man could be the Messiah? And they went out to see for themselves. The woman at the well has, has been known by Jesus. And now she, what does she do? She wants to go to tell everybody else how much she's been known. She says, you come and know this man who knows me so well. True intimacy with God produces intimacy with others as we share in that together. I was recently talking with one uh, of our church members, Patty, and she was sharing about when she came to Jesus, when she first uh, became a follower of Jesus. And she had grown up going to church, but she didn't have a real relationship with, with Jesus. And then when uh, uh, her and her husband moved uh, into a new home, and, uh, and they were getting to know new people in the area, and, uh, and she, they started to hang out with a, a friend who had a group of church friends. So she was around a lot of these church friends and these Christians. 
And they would often um, talk about Jesus in a way that was like they knew Jesus, like they like, had a personal relationship with Jesus. And, and, and Patty, Patty told me that it was like this light bulb moment when she, she realized she was missing something, right? She was missing who God really was, that she was known by him, and he was inviting her to know him. Patty's new friends knew Jesus, and they had a relationship, and that intimacy they had drew Patty in as well. There's nothing better for us as individuals to know and know God and be known by him, but, and that's what being saved is all about. But we're not only saved for intimacy with God, we're also saved for intimacy with one another. Becoming like Jesus means letting others know your longings so they can celebrate when your hopes come true. At the end of this story, uh, the disciples come back and they're concerned about Jesus because he hasn't had anything to eat like all, all morning. They're like, Jesus, are you hungry? You need some food? And Jesus is like, boys, I have food to eat you don't know about right now. Right? I am full. And they're like, did somebody give him food? He's like, no, you don't get it. I just had an experience with this woman where she was known, and she now knows me. I am so full right now. And he says, look, boys, you see these fields out there? They are ripe for harvest. And I'm not talking about wheat fields. I'm talking about people. They are so longing and thirsty to know God and be known by him. Who needs food right now? I have everything I need. Jesus was inviting his disciples into, into a celebration and to, to rejoice with him. He wanted his friends to have the same joy he did, right? And Jesus um, also knew pain, and he wanted his friends to be with him in his pain. Becoming like Jesus means letting others know our pain and how they can support us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before Jesus was going to be crucified, he told his disciples, his closest friends, that he was sorrowful unto death. He let them hear his groans, and he let them see the dread on his face, and he asked them to pray for him, to support him in his struggle. See, knowing and being known the way Jesus does it is true authenticity. It's the kind of friendship that's honest, authentic, and open. Knowing and being known is certainly not less than authenticity, but it's much more than that. And hear me here. Authenticity is something our culture really prizes, but it's not the whole package. The gift of intimacy with others that God wants to give us is far better than what our culture defines as knowing and being known. Our culture makes authenticity the end-all, be-all. So that being friends just means that I can say whatever I want to say and do whatever I want to do, and you'll affirm me in that because it's my authentic self. Well, our culture doesn't realize that while authenticity is great, it's not enough for real friendship. Authenticity is very important, but we can be authentically wrong. There's a difference between what's authentic and what's right. And in a relationship, our society and culture pressures us to treat others' feelings and opinions as sacred, as long as they're genuine, right? You be you, right? And, and that's fine, whatever. And we're so idolizing authenticity that we're losing touch with reality, Jesus makes it clear to the Samaritan woman that there is a right and wrong. He doesn't mince words when he tells her earlier, you Samaritans worship what you do not know, but we Jews know who, were we, who we are worshiping because salvation comes through the Jewish people. And as followers of, Jew, uh, of Jesus, we follow and we worship a Jewish Messiah. And our faith has a history. It's not just something we made up. It's not just our opinion or a story we happen to like. We trust that it's fact, that it's reality, that it's true. And that's why in our friendships, it's not enough to be authentic with each other. We have to be more than authentic. In our book, Good Boundaries and Goodbyes, Lisa Turker says, we must not confuse the good commands to love and forgive with the bad realities of enabling and covering up things that are not honoring to God. She also says, distortions of reality feed dysfunctions. Are you letting distortions of reality feed dysfunctions in your relationships with people and your friendships? And you're letting things kind of slide? Jesus did not let people's distortions of reality, no matter how authentic they were, now genuine, he didn't let those hang in the air between him and his friends. He called them out. Yet he loved sinners. He does love sinners. And he steps in to save them. And he calls them to be with him. But he also says, stop living in sin. 
Jesus sets up boundaries with people. In John 2, 24 through 25, it says that Jesus was no dummy in, in, in so many words. He knew not to open up his heart to just anyone. He guarded his heart. Jesus is friendly with everyone, but he's not everyone's friend. He has boundaries of right and wrong. Proverbs 17, 17 through 18 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. One without sense enters an agreement and puts up security for his friend. I love this. The Proverbs often do this. They put two ideas next to each other that seem contradictory, right? The first set's talking about having a brother that's, having a friend that loves at all times, right? In all situations, in all, in all weathers, right? I'll always stick with you. I'll always be your friend. But the next couple verses say, one without sense enters an agreement and puts up security with our friend. It's, it's not wise to just open ourselves wide and give full access to people that we can't trust, Friendship is about commitment, loving and sticking to each other for the long haul. But we've got to be careful with our trust, even with those we call friends. We can't simply open wide the gates, giving full access. I love this by Lisa Turkus, uh, too. She says, we need a person's level of responsibility to match their level of access. Jesus wants to bring us into intimacy with each other. And that requires growing into people who love each other through thick and thin and who draw boundaries for each other between right and wrong. And this isn't easy. It's going to take work and time and prayer. And I just want to leave you now with two, two things. Two things to help us grow strong in our friendships. Number one, be intimate with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It all comes back to this. If we can't have intimacy with God, we can't have true intimacy with each other. You fell in love with God at one point in your life, maybe, but now you just say hi every now and then. You need to get back your first love. You need to take time to stoke the fire of intimacy with God. And as you do that, it will open up new areas of intimacy with others. There's three ingredients to intimacy. Frequency, intensity, and fluency. Frequency. This is all about discipline and habit. It's about getting into your warrior, that part of you that can push through, that can stay the course. How often do you think of God? How often do you speak of God? How often do you listen to him, fill your thoughts and heart with him? The more that you're present with God, the more that you'll experience his present with you. So how often are you pursuing him? If it's once a week, try to make it once a day. If it's once a day in the morning, why don't you try to make it twice a day, morning and the evening? And then keep it up. And once you've gotten into that habit, maybe try a little bit more. Increase it a little bit more. And finally, maybe one day you might find that God is always present to you. All the time. Frequency. Builds intimacy. The second one is intensity. This is about passion and feeling. It's getting into your lover, that part of you that can connect with emotions at their full range. Joy, sadness, pain, fear, anger, and longing. Do you ever let yourself go there with God? Do you give him access to the depths of your heart? Lovers don't just say, quick, I love you in the morning and good night before bed. Lovers linger together. They look into each other's eyes and they hold that gaze to see and show each other what's happening in their hearts. And if you want to grow in intensity with God, then instead of giving him three minutes, try giving him 30 minutes. If you're reading your Bible, instead of only looking at the words, look for him through the words. In our scripture and prayer group here at church, we intentionally try to uh, lock onto a single word or phrase when we read scripture together. And we slow down to talk with God about what he's saying to us through that word or phrase. It's, it's, it's not about the reading. It's about connecting with God through it. Intensity means increasing time. But not just time, it's time with God. It's time plus focus. We rev up the intensity by locking eyes and hearts with God long enough to get past the surface level to the depths. And then the third thing is fluency. To build intensity with, or to build intimacy with God, we have to increase our fluency. And that means our understanding. Our understanding. It's about getting into your sage, that part of you that can communicate, that can listen and respond, that can grow in having a conversational relationship with God. Part of what makes prayer hard is that we don't know what to talk about with God or how to listen to his voice. 
And most of that can be solved by the first two things, increasing our frequency and intensity with him. But another thing we can do is build up a prayer language. What do I mean by prayer language? Well, I think that a lot of people learn to pray like this. They hear others pray. They hear others pray in church, at home. They say the same meal prayers as their parents did growing up. And in Bible studies and other church groups, we learn to pray by hearing the phrases and the words of others. And we add these to our prayers. And that's good. But what happens, though, is that we don't get beyond that, right? It's like a second grader who's learned to read Dr. Seuss but never reads any, any grade higher, right? Or like me, when I learned Portuguese, uh, once I learned not Portuguese, I learned some phrases in Portuguese when I went to Brazil. Uh, and I could say, excuse me, thank you. And if someone asked me if I spoke Portuguese, I could say, a little, un pouco. Uh, to build up your prayer language, though, it requires going beyond a, a few phrases. And, and it's, it's not that hard to do, actually. This is the cool part. It's Christians have been learning to pray for centuries by praying the Psalms. And there's 150 lessons for you in there. But don't get overwhelmed by that. You don't have to go through 150 Psalms. Just start with one, and that will give your prayer language more fluency. Here's an idea. We're about to enter into a 40-day season of fasting during Lent. This Wednesday starts that. So why not take 40 days to absorb the language of Psalm 42? As a deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you, O God. What if that became the words on your lips? What if that became natural in, in your prayer language with God? Or maybe the language of Psalm 27. One thing I've asked of the Lord, this is what I seek, to dwell in his house all the days of my life. Start adding the language of other prayers into your prayer language. Go to David in the Psalms. Go to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Go to Jesus and look at how he prays to God. All right, so second and last thing. The second best thing you can do to grow your friendship is to talk about your relationship with God with others. Talk about God with others. This actually might seem a little bit weird You know, if you think about just sitting down with somebody and talking about Jesus, but try it. See what happens. Talk about a story you've been reading in in, in the Gospels. Talk about something that Jesus is telling you or teaching you or showing in your life. Man, it's a great conversation. Go there with another, and that will actually then take you deeper with that person. And you'll find that as you talk about God, you're drawn into intimacy with others as well. That's what happens to the woman in this story, right? She brings others in. We take our cue from her. She didn't just tell others about herself and her life, but she brought them to Jesus. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And they did come see him. And when they met Jesus, they got to know him and be known by him for themselves. And they said to her, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves And we know that he is the savior of the world. Someone might be here and you don't know Jesus at all. You don't have a personal relationship with him. And I want to invite you, if that's you and you want that, that you would come and seek that, that you would talk to me, that you would come and ask me about that, you would come and ask maybe a friend who's invited you here to tell you about Jesus to tell you about what it means to know him. As we go into a time of communion, I invite you to take your communion elements. Communion is all about entering into the heart of God and him entering into us. We eat this bread and we drink this cup as a way of inviting God in. I want to be known by you, God, and I want to know you. Come all the way in. Come into my life. So as we take communion here, I invite you, as you come forward to the, uh, to the tables and take the elements, I invite you to say that. Come on in, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come and know me fully. So, Father, we come before you, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, pour out the love of God in our hearts and teach us your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.